ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to have on the show with me today an old friend from Newfoundland who I haven't seen in a long time, um, John Pastore. Now, when I met John, I think we all called you Johnny back then. Does anybody call you Johnny anymore? Not really. No, it's funny. But I mean, every once in a while, but not not like not like back then. <laughs> well, yeah, because I saw it's, it's all John on all of your media, and I thought it, we all called him Johnny. I'm sure, but that might have just been Chris Jarrett because he was always, you know, doing what people didn't want to do. Right. Uh, it might have been just him <laughs> annoying you when we were around, but. Um, Johnny was part of the hardcore scene that you've all heard me talk about a lot. Um, and um, it was, um, I remember the first time, I, I'm not sure, you were with Public Ellie, Public Enemy at the time, which was a St. John's hardcore band before the rap group came out. And um, I was starting a band, I had something on the go with Clark and Lou, and we were working a lot at the French Society. And when I mean working, wow. I mean, he had the keys for the French Society where his mom worked, and we used to win at night and jam. Um, but I seem to remember a period of time where me and you were kind of hanging out a little bit. And I don't remember if it was through skateboards or if we were jamming together, but I remember being at your house several times and you had all of these amazing hardcore posters that I think you were getting from somebody you knew in Montreal. Okay. Does that, that ring any bells? It does, but only vaguely, but okay. I mean, it sounds right. <laughs> I feel like we practiced once in my basement or a couple of times. It might've been something like that. And I think it was with you, me, and Clark, and then I guess it would be Llewellyn drumming? It was either Llewellyn, it would have been, yeah, it was before Rod Wills was around, so I think it would have been Definitely Llewellyn. Before Rod, yeah. yeah. And I do remember hanging out at the French Francophone Society, yeah. but I can't remember practicing. Or That was sort of off Duckworth somewhere, right? Yeah, up the hill a little bit? A little block up the way, yeah. Yeah, so I remember hanging out there, and I, I'm sure I must have practiced there. Yeah, I'm but sure we I, all did. Yeah. 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 Because that was a it was a kind of a big space to have available to us. Yes. Yeah. But the posters, where were you getting them all from back then? I can't remember. Like I wrote a lot of letters to people. So people okay. must have just mailed. It must have just been all through the mail, I guess. But at this point now, I can't remember. <laughs> Well, everything was kind of mail back mail order back then. You know, we, we'd always wait for an alternative tentacles record to come in. And no matter what it was, you'd buy it just for the order sleeve inside, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so so you were early on into the do the uh, sort of collecting of punk rock me memorabilia, you know, as it was happening in the early 80s. Yeah, definitely. And certainly records. I mean, that I still have all the records that I bought, you know, when I was a teenager. You do. Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. You'll have them all, which is crazy. I never sold anything. So you're so lucky. I, I'm on I'm on to my third, if not fourth collection. I, I lost the first one when I left Newfoundland and then I lost another one during a breakup. And then um, I, I'm, I'm rebuilding again now. But yeah, I'm back buying all the original. Well, not original, the repressings of, you know, minor threat and all that stuff. Yeah, it's gotten pretty expensive to buy the originals of anything these days. That's for sure. Oh, I'm sure. And you've got all that stuff, eh? Everything. Everything that I bought when I was in high school and, you know, as soon as I left, I still have it all. So originals of everything. Oh, man. That's the retirement plan. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So we're, we, we have a little bridge to gap. We're at your house. We're jamming. I'm in awe over these punk rock posters that you've got with SNFU and the asexuals and DOA and, uh, and all of these other things. Um, and then our paths split you went to montreal i went to toronto and from toronto i went on tour in montreal you went to wherever you are now which i believe is new york city is that yes. correct well and, yeah i went to england for a year first and then to new york okay and now you um tell me about Out outer battery records is this your brainchild and your business it's, it's it is but it's me and dave sweet apple okay so dave is in with you on this yeah exactly so it's dave and i Oh, very cool. I have very fond memories of Dave as well. Another, there was, the, I've told everybody about this massive punk rock Atlantic place circuit, but there was also this little side circuit of elite punk rockers. <laughs> that was uh, Sweet Apple, Jarrett, uh, Pastore, and uh, Armstrong, I believe, was the other one. And, and you right. four <laughs> sort of had your own little, your own little world of punk rock. And, and the rest of us were, were, um, were sort of ingratiated every now and again into that world. Um, <laughs> So it's you and Sweet Apple doing this. That's very yeah. cool. And we were going to call it Battery Records, but that already existed because mm -hmm. Dave and I both grew up in the battery, but Dave grew up in the outer battery. So that's where the name came from. Okay. 
Uh, it's a fantastic name. Um, now, I thought you grew up up from the uh, what was that big bar? You know where Elizabeth Avenue comes from and it comes to an end, the Stanley Steamer or whatever it was. Oh yeah, well that was only that was only like probably when I would have met you. I was there. Yeah. But we moved to the Battery when I was four, and we left when I was fifteen. Okay, so I didn't so, meet you at the Battery House. I met or, you. Yeah, or 16, maybe even like so only for a year or two. Um, when my parents got divorced, my father moved to Barnes Road. So that was the other either mm -hmm. Barnes Road or for my last two years of high school would have been Barnes Road or Tunis Court. That's the that's the one kind of below Elizabeth Avenue. Right. But it's weird how many people I know from Newfoundland know me from there, even though it was only two years of my life if that makes sense well that so was probably know. a very social time right because yeah, that was, was my, your house and it seemed like your house was on a regular rotation of places to drop into you know yeah and it was the last two years of high school you know so that's when you're just hanging out all the time exactly yeah that makes sense uh, so you were actually a downtowner oh a hundred percent yeah the, i always thought you were sort of a midtown uh midtown uh, middle class uh you know sort of uh, oh, yeah. No, uh, we moved to bat the Battery in 1971, and then my father bought the house on Barnes Road in 1980. So for the most part, I was split between the Battery and Barnes Road. And then even for those two years that I was at on Tunis Court, I was going back and forth between the Battery and Tunis Court. So half of it was still, uh, not the Battery, sorry, Barnes Road. Barnes Road, yeah. Yeah. So out of my life in Newfoundland, it was 95% either the Battery or Barnes Road. Wow. So growing up in the Battery, you know, I, I grew up in town, as you know, but I grew up on the, the, the northern end of town. My backyard went to the tree line that there was trees right out to the airport. Um, and I know that I spent all my time in the woods as a kid, you know, uh, and in the winters and stuff, just having a ball in the woods. What was it like growing up in the Battery where you're right hanging off the cliff on the water almost? I mean, just staring at the ocean my my bedroom window was was like right into the like where the big salt um you know that huge yeah. pile of, yeah that's what I would look out at um yeah it was fun I mean it you know it's I say that I could throw a rock from my window and it would land in the ocean but it would probably take two throws you know <laughs> if I picked it up then I could that one would make it in the ocean so I mean I, I smelled salt my yeah. whole life you know it, it so yeah, it was fun. Like, um, but it, it, like, I had a paper route when I was younger up Signal Hill, and that was fun but brutal. <laughs> like, yeah. Winter time, trying to fight my way up the even on the sidewalk, and then once you got up where the hotel was, those houses were just there was no roads. Like, I don't think you could even drive into them. So I'd be taking these snowy paths, delivering newspapers and stuff. Wow, that's amazing. I um. I didn't really discover downtown until I was 13 or 14 when I kind of met the sort of scene down there and uh, started skateboarding and playing punk rock. Um, but I think it'd be fascinating to grow up that close to the harbor as a child. Yeah, it, it was it was fun, like because, it, you know, it, it obviously St. John's isn't a huge city, but it felt like urban living because, mm -hmm. you know, basically Water Street ended at the base of my house where that, those old paint factories and stuff were. So mm -hmm. I, I felt I felt like I was in a city you know yeah. like it, it felt like inner city living even though it was well you know, it, it, it was pretty small you you were in the heart of the city you know yeah definitely and the best the best seat in the house for new year's eve fireworks too oh i mean the view was unbelievable like i still can't believe that that like my bedroom was on the second floor i faced out over the harbor and we were only the like third house in on the battery Yes. Yeah. So, uh, well, is that the Battery Cafe? I think that might be what it's called now. That that used to be the corner store there. And we were like across the street in two houses. So it was the whole harbor laid out in front of me. Like it's just a million dollar view. I actually did a video right from across your house this summer when I was home because I was waiting to do an interview at the Battery Cafe and I walked in a couple houses. Oh, and okay, I walked yeah. around with my camera. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, so, so they, I know exactly where you're talking about. They've made it, when we bought it, it was a single family, big boxy Victorian from the 1870s with a huge yard. And then they built two lookalike houses on it, maybe in the 90s. So now if you look at it, there's it's a row of three houses, but the mm -hmm. only one that was there was the center one. Wow. 
And yeah, it was it changed a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, the battery was artsy, but run down when I was a kid. Like, and now there's, you know, there's money and there's fancy yeah. houses and stuff out there. Well, St. John's was, I mean, downtown St. John's was artsy and run down. Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, and that's, it, it gave the artists a cheap place to live. And because we were all so tight, I think that's that's a big part of why the community there was so thriving, you know, especially, you know, you remember the years when we were growing up, we had all the punk rockers and then we had all the theater kids and then we were doing stuff with the adult crowd, the Codco folks at the time. And right. the art scene was so good. I was asking Andrew Young husband about it recently when I spoke to him and I said, you know, so what do you think happened to downtown? And he just said the artists got driven out because you can't afford to live there anymore. Right. Yeah. No. So that community is dispersed and it's not as tight and vibrant as it used to be. You know, it's, um, yeah, yeah. there's a name for it. Sadly, that's happening everywhere. Like all of the sort of cool cities, you know, when you moved to Toronto or I moved to Montreal, it was easy to live right in the center because the people with money didn't want to live there. So, yeah. and I wish they'd all sort of stayed out in the suburbs and, you know, kept it to themselves and, but now the most expensive places are where we lived easily. You know, you I could have found any apartment I wanted in the center of Montreal anytime I wanted. Like, yeah. And if I had, had been thinking I could have bought anything I wanted back then, but we weren't thinking like that in those days. Yeah. Yeah. I I I, I think about sort of some of the, you know, the moves from houses that me and Allison made. You know, the first house that we left in Toronto now is is right in the middle of the Good Arund Warts district. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, we, we, at the time, it was just like old, decrepit, rundown areas. And, and we had a, the, Allison's parents had a um, a company with a living space above. So we lived uh, below and the company was downstairs. And we sold that place for a, you know, just bottom barrel to get out. And now it's, I mean, that would have been I, prime, prime, prime Toronto real estate. Yeah. And God, I mean, Toronto doesn't even need to be prime to be expensive anymore. It could be the worst part of it imaginable. And it's still yeah. impossible. Yeah, I'm glad to be out of the city. I, I never, I never really felt comfortable in the city. You know, I, I did, I did my first three or four, no, my first year in the city, and then I moved to, um, I moved to a boat, and I stayed over there for eleven years. Oh right, right. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I didn't like being in the city at all. Is that just in Toronto Harbor, or where was the boat? Over on Toronto Island. I took the ferry back and forth every day. Oh, nice. Okay, wow, Toronto Island. Yeah, that's a cool spot. It's beautiful. You know, nine o'clock at night, the last ferry goes, you have the whole island to yourself. All the flower gardens are maintained. You know, it's it's beautiful. Yeah. No, I haven't been out there in forever, but I remember sometime in the early 90s going out there. It was so peaceful and so nice. Like, mm -hmm. Gorgeous piece of land. I don't know what it's like now. <clears throat> um, I don't know if I'll ever get back there now that I think about it. Well, maybe they, I should visit someday. They have some kinds of protections, right, to keep them from that getting overdeveloped out there? or They did for a long time. Um, you know, there's always been there's always been political debates happening over there. You know, when I was living over there, the Wards Islands residents were still there on the east end of the island, and they were kind of living illegally, but they had purchased houses at some point. So they kind of owned them and then they were on leases from the government and some were running out and they were trying to get extensions. Um, and then the east end of the island was completely vacant. And then there was the marina in the center. <clears throat> but I know that you know, they've been talking about developing it for years. I mean, at one point in time, the history of the island was that it was where all the brothels and bars were. Oh, and really? It, uh, and it was attached. It had a walk over bridge and it was all hotels, brothels and bars like back in the day, back in the oh, 20s and 30s. I never knew that. That's crazy. Yeah, it was a big developed. It was like a big strip and um, it was the big party zone for all the illegal activities. And, you know, eventually that all got shut down and, and plowed down. And then, uh, you know, the few remaining people on wards managed to fight to stay there and, uh, so they've still got claims against it there, but it's just a matter of time till, you know, something comes and wants it and they've got enough money and they take it. I'm sure. Yeah. That's too bad, but yeah, that's, you know, maybe it won't happen. Maybe. Right. <laughs>